Welcome to New Economic Thinking. We're here with Thomas Fazzi. Thank you very much for joining us and Thank being you. at INET. So what is New Economic Thinking to you? Well, I think first of all it is, uh, I mean, I think we're going through a very interesting time where policy is changing uh, at a pretty fast pace. Uh, well, more or less everywhere except in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, but theory is, uh, is not catching up or is, 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 uh, is, is quite slow at catching up with that. So I think the first thing is looking at the changes. And the first thing that we should be doing is looking at the changes in policy and trying to really um, understand them and find, uh, and find theories to explain uh, why these changes have been necessary in terms of, for example, monetary policy, uh, unconventional monetary policy, and so on. I think uh, what we have seen in recent years in countries like the United States and Japan and the UK is quite uh, radical policies for which we, uh, we don't really have a name yet, or at least we're not calling them by their real name. So of course we call them unconventional monetary policies or come up with terms like quantitative easing mm -hmm. when maybe we should be talking of things like debt monetization, uh, which is arguably what has been happening in some countries. But of course it's, uh, you know, it's, it's considered um, um, you know, unwise to, uh, to, to say so. So I, think, so I think, first of all, we should be looking at what's happened and, uh, and trying to understand what is effectively happening. So you, do you think that those things that are taboo, or that we cannot say, have been helping the recovery or hindering the recovery? Well, I think if we look at, uh, if we compare the countries that have pursued these so-called unconventional policies and Europe, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to argue with the fact that those countries have recovered much better than, than Europe. Uh, in terms of GDP growth, uh, unemployment, and so on. Um, if we look at the United States uh, and Japan, and well, especially the United States and the UK, both uh, countries have returned to um, uh, pre-growth levels quite a while ago. And as we know, the Eurozone is still below pre-crisis levels. I think there's little doubt that this is a direct consequence of the austerity policies and of the fact that we have not uh, engaged in the sort of unconventional policies that other countries have pursued. But now the ECB has moved in that direction. Well, yes, but I think, again, uh, that's why I think it's important to understand what these other countries have been doing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people attribute the recovery in the United States, for example, to quantitative easing and to the, e the Fed's uh, expansion monetary policies, mm -hmm. when I think... Um, the real uh, explanation for the recovery is expansionary fiscal policy in the United States, which was, of course, made possible by the Fed's policies, uh, without which there would not have been the recovery, the recovery so that we've seen. So you mean the Obama stimulus? Absolutely, absolutely. I think, you know, I mean, the, the United States ran very large deficits for uh, quite a few years after the crisis. And I think the Fed's policies were, uh, were um, of course, you know, a monetary policy in a classic sense, but were also, you know, a monetary slash fiscal policy in a sense that those policies aided the, 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 the government's fiscal, expansionary fiscal policies by keeping uh, borrowing costs down for the government. And arguably the same could be said of Japan. Arguably the same could be said of Japan, absolutely. And do you think and in I that think, case, sorry. Uh, and I think that's why the ECB's QE is likely to have a little impact on, on the real economy precisely because it is viewed uniquely as a, as a, as a form of monetary policy uh, with no role for fiscal policy uh, and actually accompanied by contractionary uh, fiscal policy, i.e. austerity. Uh, so any, I think, positive impact of the expansionary uh, monetary policies will be offset by the negative uh, impact of the, uh, of the uh, recessionary fiscal policies uh, that we have seen and we will continue to see uh, in a... Um, uh, you know, within the current framework. And in that case, the UK that has been contracting its its fiscal sort of deficit, what do you think about that? Do you think that the recovery will be shallower or? Absolutely, I think that is definitely going to harm the recovery in the in the UK. Uh, and I think the recovery that we have seen uh, is also largely driven by private debt. And so uh, I think we will continue to see an increase in private debt. Uh, especially as the, the government's uh, fiscal deficit is reduced. I think we will see a corresponding increase in private debt. I think that is... Um, so when you talk about austerity, do you refer to spending cuts alone or all structural reforms? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, uh, of course, fiscal consolidation, I think, is what has had the most direct impact, negative impact on the economies of a number of, uh, of, a number of countries. I think that uh, by the, at this point, this is... Um, this is quite clear, I think, and has been, uh, I think, also confirmed by a number of, uh, uh, of studies by the IMF and so on in terms of the um, fiscal multiplier of austerity policies and so on. 
according to some studies, uh, GDP is, uh, you know, from seven, eight to nine to ten percent lower now because uh, in the eurozone because of the austerity measures. Um, but of course, austerity is also structural reforms, which, um, again, you know, what do we mean by structural reforms? Uh, you know, I think we have come to understand structural reforms to mean uh, the liberalization of uh, labor markets, um, um, wage devaluation in uh, so-called periphery countries, and so on. I think these kind of structural reforms um, have shown to have a negative effect. Uh, Italy, my country, for example, is a country that, uh, unlike what is often thought, has pursued uh, quite a few number of reforms, for example, in terms of, in terms of the liberalization of the labor market, uh, without that having uh, any positive impact on uh, unemployment or growth levels, and actually having a negative impact on productivity levels uh, in, many, in many respects. And uh, if we look at a country like Greece, um, which has significantly cut uh, wages since the start of the crisis, uh, now, if that was one of the main causes for the Greek crisis, uh, we would have seen a surge in exports in Greece following the reduction in, uh, in, in labor costs, but that has not happened. Uh, you know, exports have not picked off in, uh, in Greece. And the same can be said for a number of periphery countries which have rebalanced their trade balance, but mostly as a result of reduced imports rather than So you uh, think that the recovery exports. in Ireland or in Spain is mainly ex explained by... Well, I think I think you know. I mean, each 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 country has its uh, its own specific. Uh, I think I mean uh, conditions. I mean, if we look at Ireland, uh, I think again, it's it would be a mistake to look simply at GDP growth because uh, I think there's a lot of there's a lot that goes into the Irish GDP which doesn't really contribute that much to the to the actual uh, um, that doesn't really go to the benefit of the economy. So, the, um, for example, a lot of the GDP growth in Ireland is accounted for by um, exports of multinationals, uh, which largely take their profits out of the country and don't leave much in Ireland and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we have to, uh, I think just looking at the recovery in terms of GDP is, uh, is a bit, um, is, uh, is, not, is not sufficient, I think. So would, in, in it, let's talk a little bit more about Italy. Mm -hmm. So what, is, what, in your view and based on your work, has gone wrong in Italian policymaking? Well, I mean, I'm not trying to say that Italy doesn't have long-term structural problems that need to be solved. I mean, I think this is, this is obvious. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, you know, what, what are these long-term trends? And, uh, and also, is the collapse in GDP and the massive rise in unemployment that we have seen since the crisis a result, um, mainly a result of these long-term uh, negative trends, uh, of this long-term decline, or the result of the uh, fiscal policies that have been pursued since the start of the, of the crisis? Now, uh, I think the long-term causes um, are definitely partly responsible for what we've witnessed. But I think, you know, when the, st the really steep collapse in GDP that we've seen since the crisis, uh, and especially since the implementation of fiscal consolidation, shows that um, there, is a, um, there is a clear impact of these, poli of these policies on, uh, on, on the Italian economy, negative impact. Um, so... So how would we improve that? What, what, what do you think is the best way well, forward? I think, I mean, in the short term, it's clear that Italy has a problem of, of, of demand. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we, we, uh, consumption has fallen really drastically. Mm -hmm. um, unemployment is a very serious problem. Uh, according to some estimates, it's higher than it's ever been in the country's history um, at the moment. Um, you know, the debt-to-GDP ratio is ballooning. Uh, so I think you know we we have to uh, we have to we have to say that these policies are not working even even according to the official uh, sort of um, aims of these policies. Supposedly, you know, uh, one of the main aims of fiscal consolidation is to reduce the the public debt. But we've seen the opposite happening, not just in not just in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, so Italy has a problem of productivity that is clearly an issue. Um, but again, you know, is that due to the fact that it has, a, you know, a hyper rigid labor market, uh, as is often asserted, or is it due to, uh, to low investment, especially in R and D and so on, uh, in which, which is Italy very is, low in Italy, yeah. which is one of the lowest levels in the world? Yeah. So I think, you know, maybe this is what we should be looking about, uh, is what we should be looking to to solve, rather than further flexibilizing and labor, uh, liberalizing the the labor market which has shown to have uh, fairly negative effects, uh, especially in terms of productivity. So I think you know, we need real productive investment, um, both public and private, to, uh, to make the economy uh, more competitive in a way. But of course, this requires, um, this requires um, money 
uh, you know, as, at the public level, um, which is what Italy doesn't doesn't have at the moment because it has such high interest payments. You know, Italy pays about five percent of GDP in interest payments every uh, every year. Which That's is much more than the investment, which is which is way more. And um, and of course, you know, this this. Uh, this, this causes a huge drag on the economy. I mean, it has forced Italy to run a primary surplus of about 2% of GDP since the early 90s. And uh, I think this is also one of the causes for Italy's long-term stagnation. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think it's, it's, it's quite well understood that running a primary surplus does have a, uh, a recessionary effect on the, on the economy. I mean, you're effectively taking out money from, uh, from people's pockets through taxes and, you know, giving it away to the creditors, which are usually, you know, the banks or the well-off uh, people in the economy. But, you, but the <clears throat> Italian government are constrained by the European rules. Mm -hmm. So that means that if you want to implement some of these changes, you would have to change the European rules. Absolutely. Um, again, you know, I mean, I think the, uh, the, what we're witnessing in, in the Eurozone is really a case of uh, sort of voluntary servitude. Of course, you know, we have all these rules, but these rules are only can only exist insofar as, you know, national governments are willing to, to go along and to not to channel, uh, challenge these rules. And, uh, you know, um, I don't mean just, you know, acting like a child, you know, stamping your feet on the ground, you know. I mean, you know, challenging, challenging them at the institutional level, uh, you know, within the European framework. But, uh, but you know, but, but, but really, um, I think what we're lacking is a political class in Italy and other countries that is willing to really fight for, uh, you know, the national interest and of course you know I think you can I think you know the European interest and the national interest can go hand in hand I don't think one excludes the other um, so you're not arguing for the end of the eurozone I'm not, absolutely I mean I think you know a, a breakup of the eurozone and especially a unilateral exit by uh, one or more countries um, would be very problematic both for the individual country uh, you know if say Greece were to leave uh, we're as well land. as for the entire eurozone yeah. I think uh, there's I see too much complacency around in terms of uh, what people assume the consequences of, for example, a Greek exit to be. I think they would be much more problematic than people uh, than people assume to be in terms of. I mean, I think it could easily lead to the breakup of the entire eurozone. And like what is often asserted now, there's this idea that you know things have been sanitized, and so if Greece were to leave, it wouldn't be a problem. I don't think so. I think what we need is for these policies to be challenged, you know, within the European framework. And again, for countries to uh, fight for their legitimate national interest. I think. One of the problems that we have seen since the introduction of the Eurozone is that one country, uh, Germany especially, has been um, pursuing its national interests, legitimate national interests, quite, uh, quite, quite, quite well, quite efficiently. Uh, and that in itself is not a problem. Uh, I think, as I said, you know, I think that's, that's fairly legitimate. Uh, the real problem is that a number of other countries have given up doing the same. And so this has led to a very imbalanced, uh, um, I think, a relation of power within the Eurozone. Um, so what I would like to see is governments, uh, is countries like Italy, like Spain, uh, you know, willing to challenge Germany on some on on on, on some on some of the eurozone's rules, and uh, on the eurozone's architecture in general, which has gone to uh, the detriment of of a number of countries uh, for a number of reasons. You know, I think some of which have to do with the political class and decisions taken by the political classes in those countries and periphery countries. Others are uh, are really. Um, um, have to do with external causes over which I think, you know, either the citizens or the polit or political class in, in those countries have, could, could do little about, such as, you know, I mean, there's literally, you can do in the face of massive capital inflows mm -hmm. into your country, uh, which is what we saw after the introduction of the Eurozone. I think there's very little that, uh, that, that policymakers can do uh, to, to, to stop that from leading to, uh, you know, massive bubbles and booms and, and so on. So I think, it, you know, it's, it's fairly wrong to blame the citizens or even the governments of those countries for, uh, for example, for the bubbles that we saw in countries like um, Ireland and Spain and, and so on. Uh, there was a lack of, of supervision. But then again, you know, as it has been mentioned by various speakers at this, at this conference, you know, I mean, this, uh, you know, the, the free flow of, of capital uh, within the Eurozone is one of the tenets of, uh, of the Eurozone. So maybe that is one of the things that we should be, that we should be talking about. And maybe... Um, um, putting into question. Thomas, thank you very much for, for joining us today and thank for you. bringing your views uh, to the conference and to INET as a whole. Thank, thank you. you very much.